Okay, I should probably uh, step back to uh, uh, botnets, which we touched on last time, but uh, uh, we probably need to cover in a bit more detail. Um, now, uh, originally, uh, as I think I mentioned, was uh, spam botnets um, that uh, they were just uh, starting to uh, explore the possibilities of massive amounts of spam um, and trying to, I mean, at the time, uh, basically you could blacklist yeah, even specific addresses, let alone the main. Uh, so, uh, it was, it was, you know, fairly easy. So spam botnets would uh, uh, get around that, of course, by the fact that the, the messages were coming from a bunch of different, uh, either domain names or, or at least IP addresses. So uh, you, you couldn't uh, all of a sudden blacklist the IP addresses and expect to succeed. The uh, it also allows you to uh, get the message out faster. Uh, many, many more copies of a given message. So, uh, you know, the, the advantages of doing that in terms of spamming are, are fairly obvious. The um, extension, though, of um, botnets in, in general, um, uh, well, I suppose that the next stage, the next step in uh, using it for some kind of attack purpose was uh, DDoS nets, distributed denial of service attacks. Now, denial of service attack very often would just attempt to uh, busy out a given machine or resource uh, in a variety of ways. It depends on uh, how you were doing it. Sometimes it would just, you know, attempt to log into the machine and never complete the uh, the login sequence. Um, so that would tie up the available login ports for a certain amount of time. Um, all you would need to do is just, you know, repetitively start the login process and never complete it. And uh, keep on going with that and you could effectively remove a machine from contact with with other systems uh, because uh, nobody else could get a, a connection in um, however uh, other types of, of denial of service I mean uh, there were various services that sprang up uh, to to try and address this. There were settings that you could make on your machine, um, allow a, a shorter time for the connection process so that uh, the, the machine, if, if you did have one of these busy out uh, types of attacks, um, at least it, it wouldn't uh, go on for uh, an indefinite period of time. There would be a shortened period. And, uh, so, uh, so, Obviously, getting multiple machines to do this type of attack or other types of attacks that were uh, in the denial of service category would um, work uh, better when there were multiple sh machines doing the attacking. So, uh, you know, tying together a bunch of machines that you'd taken over control, and we have talked about the, the remote access Trojans, they would be uh, a part of this. Um, uh, and, and so that was, you know, a second one. But very quickly, um, the need to control the, uh, the spam botnets and the uh, distributed denial of service attacks led to the realization that you could use a botnet for simply command and control of, well, basically anything. And so therefore you could use a botnet as a distributed computer for anything you wanted. Spamming, denial of service, uh, attacks of various types, um, uh, password guessing, uh, uh, 
you know, all, all kinds of things. Anything you could get a computer to do, you could get a distributed computer to do, and probably a lot faster. Um, the, uh, the initial attacks we'll get into in uh, cryptography on, uh, say, uh, the DES encryption standard, um, they were accomplished with... Uh, they, they were first successfully accomplished with uh, distributed uh, networks of computers. And uh, it's still uh, the basis for a, a lot of uh, sort of supercomputing. If you don't have a, a supercomputer, you can get a whole bunch of people uh, to lend you time on their computers. And yeah, we can, you know, do anything faster, more powerfully, uh, with distributed computers. Uh, there's a little extra work involved. As I say, the command and control involved. So, um, basically, from this point, the, uh, the botnet, uh, becomes an entity of itself. Really interesting to look into the, uh, research into command and control structures, identifying um, who are the owners of uh, given networks, and the the fluidity of this, that, that uh, those who research it will find, um, you know, very, very large botnets, which seem to be operating um, with subsets of machines. Uh, performing different tasks and uh, sometimes you kind of wonder okay are uh, you know, have they taken over a bunch of computers and then somebody else has taken partial control over their botnet uh, giving them control over uh, certain numbers of their machines it's an interesting conjecture and, and uh, interesting research um, just uh, oh a few more uh, of course the uh, the use of a botnet uh, means that um, it hides the attacker, the, the actual attacker. You're, you know, his machine is never um, part of the actual attack, and so there isn't any evidence that you collect and, unless you can get at one of the actual um, botnet machines and find out how they are receiving commands. Um, and, of course, there is the, the multiplication of the attack. Uh, so uh, we have a structure of the attacker, the uh, agent computers, the, uh, those machines that have been compromised and, and become part of the botnet, and uh, then the target of whatever is, is going on. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, so we'll, we'll leave that now. We'll go on to... Uh, executable or, or mobile code um, and uh, the problems associated with that. <laughs>